morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Some of your eyes look pretty glassy out there. It looks like you need a, a backup blanket. All right. Um, all or nothing. I think you kind of caught the glimpse of what we're going to talk about today in that verse, huh? All or nothing is what I have entitled this little talk. And uh, it's not going to be anything real difficult. I'm just going to read a little from the Bible, a little from Spirit Prophecy. Okay? Um, it is a dangerous world we live in here today, isn't it? Amen. I mean, uh, Amen. I got many years driving on the road, probably more than most. Um, and I think the worst I'd ever been in was smoke fog in Georgia. And it was with my wife in a pickup truck. And I had a big truck right behind me barreling down, and I was probably driving too fast. He was probably driving too fast. But we come on that stuff, and I mean, you couldn't see nothing. And I didn't slow down. I just kept going because I knew he was behind me. <laughs> yeah, it's dangerous. I don't know what happened, who dropped the ball, but people should have been slowing down. Anyways, it's a terrible thing. And, uh, you know, I, little things make a big change. And, you know, whoever's president makes big changes in how government is run, right? Um, so, I mean, the world's kind of crazy right now. I mean, who's to say what would have been if things were different? God knows what's going on and everything is unfolding, I suppose, as, it's, as it should. Um, I shouldn't talk politics at all, but when George Soros is screaming war, it makes me go, huh? Just had to throw that out there. Anyways, Desire of Ages. I want to read from the Desire of Ages. And uh, this will be, ooh, I didn't want that, page 57 in the Desire of Ages is how I want to begin. Let, let us have just one more little prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you that, that you know the end from the beginning. And that you've made so many promises to us. And if we would just believe them and grab a hold of all of you, let go of all this junk that we love to carry, me included. We would have all that we need. Amen. Jesus. All right. Uh, page 57, Desire of Ages. At the cross of Calvary, love and selfishness stood face to face. Here was their crowning manifestation. Christ had lived only to comfort and bless. In putting him to death, Satan manifested the malignity of his hatred against God. He made it evident that the real purpose of his rebellion was to dethrone God and destroy him through whom the love of God was shown. By the life and death of Christ, the thoughts of men also are brought to view. From the manger to the cross, the life of Jesus was a call to self-surrender. And to fellowship in suffering. Fellowship in suffering. That one's a tough one, isn't it? We don't like to suffer, do we? What does the Bible call Jesus? The man of sorrows, right? Acquainted with grief. Why do you suppose that was? Because the Bible says that God is love. Love. Love like we don't understand. We're talking about agape love. Not love for the brother. 
true love, the kind of love that Jesus showed. It unveiled the purposes of men. Jesus came with the truth of heaven, and all who were listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit were drawn to him. The worshipers of self belong to Satan's kingdom. In their attitude toward Christ, all would show on which side they stood. And thus, everyone passes judgment on himself. Did you hear that? And everyone passes judgment on himself. In the day of the final judgment, every lost soul will understand the nature of his own rejection of truth. The cross will be presented and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by transgression. Before the vision of Calvary with its mysterious victim, sinners will stand condemned. Every lying excuse will be swept away. Human apostasy will appear in its heinous character. Men will see what their choice has been. Every question of truth and error in the long-standing controversy will then have been made plain. In the judgment of the universe, God will stand clear of blame for the exi existence or continuance of evil. It will be demonstrated that the divine decrees are not accessory to sin. There was no defect in God's government, no cause for disaffection. When the thoughts of all hearts shall be revealed, both the loyal and the rebellious will unite in declaring, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Thy judgments are made manifest. I'm speaking to the board of the church here now because here it is 2022 and I gotta carry the mic around. This is crazy, okay? I don't understand. Just saying. Um, one more little thing I'd like to read before we get into the scripture. This is Mount of Blessings. This little book is the thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. This is a powerful book. If you've never read this book, this book is full of diamonds. Full of it. I was given this by the church in Dexterville, New York on December 15, 2001 in my baptism. Beautiful. Beautiful. Praise the Lord. Christ has given us no promise of help in bearing today the burdens of tomorrow. Amen. 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 You hear that? Amen. So there's no sense in fretting about anything. Amen. You know? The, the title today is All or Nothing. You can't have all if you're worried about later. you got to be now. You follow me? Okay. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee, but like the manna given in the wilderness, his grace is bestowed daily for the day's need. Like the host of Israel in their pilgrim life, we may find morning by morning the bread of heaven for the day's supply. One day alone is ours, and during this day we are to live for God. For this one day, we are to place in the hand of Christ in solemn service all our purposes and plans, casting all our care upon him, for he careth for us. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In returning and rest, shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence 
shall be your strength. If you will seek the Lord and be converted every day. Now if that's not Adventist theology, I don't know what it is. If you will work, if you will, of your own spiritual choice, be free and joyous in God. If with gladsome consent of heart to his gracious call, you come wearing the yoke of Christ, the yoke of obedience and service, all your murmurings will be stilled. All your difficulties will be removed. Did it say some of your difficulties? All of your difficulties will be removed. All the perplexing problems that now comfort you will be solved. As far as I'm concerned, with that one page from this dynamic book, we could just go home. Mm -hmm. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. So why don't we trust him? Why don't we trust him? What is it that you're holding on to? What is it that I'm holding? Is it something in this world? Is it something what? I try and I try not to try. I'm so just, I, you know, I fight God. I really do. I'd have given up on me a long time ago if I was him. Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 11. Bible says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So God, God has no evil thoughts about you, right? He has good thoughts about you. Amen. And he says he has an expected end. What does the word expected mean? He anticipates, he awaits. He hopes for and watches for you to have a glorious end. You know, to, to come to, to God by fear of punishment or hope for reward is not a, not a bad place maybe to begin, but you should never stay there. That's not what God's about. He is rooting for you. He never stops. The Holy Spirit never stops. This verse here is the one that we really want to get to. In verse 12 it says, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Do you hear that? Hearken unto you. When we call and pray, he will hear, listen, attend, and mind our call. That's what hearken means, right? Think about that. The God of heaven will hearken. That's what it said right there. This isn't my words. You didn't come here for my opinion. Okay, I may slip something in there, but I, you know it's my opinion. This is the gospel. This is, this is the Bible. Let's go to verse 13. And it says, Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. I bet you if I ask people to raise their hands, they could tell me about times in their life when they were giving God, <coughs> searching with all of their heart. And God answered that prayer. And he was with you. So the answer is easy. Right? It's not difficult. We have to be sold out. Lock, stock, and barrel. Amen. To Jesus Christ. He, he, he will not ride in the back seat. He shouldn't have to. 
He's the creator of heaven and earth. I'm going to read you a little something more from uh, Mount Prophets and Kings. Okay? Um, page 553 in Prophets and Kings. Often had Daniel and his companions gone over these these and similar prophecies outlining God's purpose for his people. You hear that? And now, as the rapid course of events betokened the mighty hand of God and work among the nations, hello, Daniel gave special thought to the promises made to Israel. His faith in the prophetic word led him to enter into experiences foretold by the sacred writers. After 70 years be accomplished in Babylon, the Lord had declared, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return. Do you think God has a prophetic time for today? Where do you think we are in history? I think most of the church is asleep. Amen. They got their, what do you call it? The what blanking? The, I don't know what you call it. The something blanky. The, the put away blanky. Whatever it was. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. And ye shall call upon me. And ye shall go and pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me. And ye shall search for me with all your heart. Shortly before the fall of Babylon, when Daniel was meditating on those or these prophecies and seeking God for an understanding of the times, do you think Daniel was sold out, lock, stock, and barrel? Do you think he was in, all in? Amen. He had to be, right? God, for an understanding of the times, a series of visions was given him concerning the rise and fall of kingdoms. With the first vision, as recorded in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, an interpretation was given, yet not all was made clear to the prophet. My cognitations, which thoughts, much troubled me, he wrote of his experience at the time. And my countenance changed in me. But I kept the matter in my heart, Daniel says in Daniel 7, 28. Through another vision, further light was thrown upon the events of the future, and it was at the close of the vision that Daniel heard one saint speaking to another saint. <clears throat> Said unto that saint which spake, How long shall be the vision? Daniel 8, 13. The answer was given unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Filled him with perplexity. Do we know anything about this prophecy? Does the world know much about this prophecy? Did something happen? At the end of the 2300 days? Yep. Yes. Earnestly he sought for the meaning of the vision. He could not understand the relation sustained by the 70 year captivity as foretold through Jeremiah to the 2300 years that in vision he had heard the heavenly visitant declare should elapse before the cleansing of God's sanctuary. Are we not living in the day of judgment, brothers and sisters? No. The angel Gabriel gave him a particular interpretation. Yet when the prophet heard the words, the vision shall be for many days, he fainted. I, Daniel, fainted. He records of his experience and was sick certain days. Afterward, I arose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision. But none understood it. There's a whole bunch here. 
But my real point I want to get to is the fact that Daniel was 100% all in. God's not going to send the number one created being, I, I would say Gabriel, okay, fourth in command, all the way to heaven, all the way to earth, to answer prayers for somebody that's half in the game. You follow me? Even though we may seem super sincere and all these things, are we really? No. I want to ask you, are we really? What is it? I can't speak for you. But it may be something tiny. In us as a corporate body, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Amen. We need to not tear each other down, but pick each other up. Amen. If there's one that's weak and slow, we help them. Pick them up. We can't leave anybody behind. You think Jesus leaves anybody behind? No. Jesus never leaves anybody behind. And Jesus is never in a hurry. I did never record anywhere in the Bible where I heard about him running anywhere. No. He never ran. Even when people said, hey, they're going to kill you. He says, it's not my time. you imagine that kind of confidence and surety? That kind of walk? Because Jesus was 100% all the time, every day. Never let go. It wasn't about him, right? He gave up him. I think that's our biggest problem, because we have to give up him. Still burdened in, the, in behalf of Israel, Daniel studied anew the prophecies of Jeremiah. There were very plain, so plain that he understood by these testimonies recorded in the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. With, with faith founded on the sure word of prophecy, Daniel pleaded with the Lord for the speedy fulfillment of these promises. He pleaded for the honor of God to be preserved. In his petition, he identified himself fully with those who had fallen short of the divine purpose, confessing their sins as his own. You hear that? Corporate repentance. Mm -hmm. I think that may be where we got off the train. Corporate repentance. Not just my sins, but the sins of my fathers. Our fathers. Mm -hmm. Right? What if we spend some time pouring ourselves out together and confessing to God corporately and individually to get this train back on the track. You think that's a possibility? You think that's something that might should happen? I mean, I think the problem with today is people don't care about hitting the mark. You know, it's easy just to throw something against the wall, right? And then paint the bullseye around it. It makes you look great. You get your participation trophy because you're first place, man. Right? The world's gone crazy. This place is nuts. I'm going to say too much. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to read some more. I set my face unto the Lord, the prophet declared, to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. I think here, brothers and sisters, is a secret. It's, it's a big secret to our victory and the church being victorious. Right here. Though Daniel had long been in the service of God, he had been spoken of by heaven as greatly beloved. Listen, greatly beloved. And he's calling himself in with everybody else. You hear that? 
There's no pride in this man. This man is extinguished of pride. Yet now appeared before God as a sinner, urging the great need the people of, of the people he loved. His prayer was eloquent in its simplicity and intensely earnest. Hear him pleading, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all of Israel that are near, and they that are afar off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespasses that they have trespassed against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, Though we have rebelled against him, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy mountains, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, thy people, are become a reproach to all that are about us. I could go on this prayer, but I think you guys get the message. And I want to turn because what I thought I was going to be preaching on today was something else and this is what what came. But I would like you to turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians and um, chapter 13. Because this is what I want to preach up to. Y'all get there to say amen. amen. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not what? Charity. Charity, love, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. What does love mean to you guys? I mean, the Beatles sang about it, right? All we need is love. Love. Think of love. others. Think of others. You know, I, after I watched the Super Bowl and saw the Super Bowl halftime, I was thinking, boy, I'd take the Beatles any day. <laughs> that was at least music. You know? I mean, they harmonized. Maybe I'm showing my age, I don't know. 